Critical Blast, where pop culture gets blasted. And I almost said good evening, everybody, because we usually stream around seven o'clock. But today is a special day. We're on a little bit early. Uh, and it is not often that I get to talk crowdfunding comics. OK, I talk crowdfunding comics every night. I know. But it's not often I get to do this with a living legend in the comic book industry. Um, I am very, very happy and pleased to welcome to the channel this afternoon, Mr. Mike Grell. Mike, how are Hi you guys? doing? So, I'm doing good. I was about to say, you know, you, you've seen him on Superman and Legion of Superheroes, obviously Green Arrow, Warlord, and of course, John Sable. And it occurred to me, I don't think I've ever seen you do any Marvel work. I, I rarely have done, um, but I am the guy who revealed Iron Man's secret identity, among other things. Wow. I, and, and, I, and I designed the new Dark Wolverine for Marvel. Uh, I did uh, X-Men Forever, and uh, they asked me specifically to design a, a new look for Wolverine. Basically, that meant that they wanted him to look as much like Hugh Jackman as possible without having to pay Jackman a license fee. <laughs> so so when, uh, when, when uh, Robert Downey Jr. says, I am Iron Man at the end of the movie, that's lifted right off of, off of your scene, then. Yes, as a matter of fact. Um, that was that was my redemption, uh, vindication, I should say. Um, I, uh, I did a story uh, where the entire world in front of cameras and everything, um, and then I got fired. Uh, <laughs> not not because I I had done it. I had the full support and cooperation approval from everybody on all the way on up the line. But there was a massive fight that broke out between two factions of fans. Um, the, the story that I had done was um, in keeping with my approach to the character, which was to uh, focus on the man inside the suit. Um, by the time I took over the book, um, the the suit had become so all powerful. There's there's no way you could uh, touch uh, Tony Stark, and in fact, Stark's body began to look exactly like the suit, with the shoulders you know three feet wide, and a a neck that sloped from the shoulders up to the top of his head, where his head was about the size of his fist, and um, uh, you know it just. His suit was just bulging all the time because of all the massive muscles he had been given over the years. So I slimmed him down, trimmed him down, uh, restored the um, the uh, inherent weakness that um, was one of the driving factors with him, which was that if he didn't recharge his suit every 24 hours, um, he could he could wind up. Uh, using up all of his energy, he could die. Um, and I uh, also included uh, a bit where it was possible for him to use his heart motor energy to power the suit uh, in a, an act that would be essentially self-sacrifice. Um, and uh, how, I, how I revealed the secret identity was... Uh, um, there was a, a news conference going on at uh, uh, Stark Industries, and they're on the patio level, several stories up above the, the street. And uh, down the street, there's a there's a robbery going on, and uh, the getaway car charges down the street, and a little boy's puppy pulls away from him, runs out into the street, and Stark doesn't even miss a beat. He goes over the side of the wall, six, seven stories up, changes into Iron Man on the way down and smashes the car to the stop. And of course, all of his friends were really pissed off at him because if they say, yeah, you kept this from us all these years and you revealed it for a dog. And <laughs> and Stark says, I didn't do it for the dog. I did it for him. He puts the little boy. Uh, what, what was personal about that was that uh, I had done a storyline where um, 
the, the, the Xenobob Pepper Potts and Happy Hogan had gotten married. And there was always that bittersweet, uh, as I saw it, the uh, connection there. Um, Stark um, knows that he screwed it up with, with Pepper. Um, and she gets pregnant. And during the course of the story, um, something that Stark is essentially responsible for um, causes her to be injured and she loses the baby. And he, uh, he sees that child as the child that should have been his, could have been, could have been his son, right? And um, so the, the, the war broke up between the fans and uh, one faction liked what I, what I did and the other faction felt that it should have been something really cosmic, you know, like an asteroid gonna collide with, uh, I don't know, Robert Downey Jr. or something like that, you know, and and uh, that that it, it should have had something, some uh -oh. world shattering uh, um, cause and effect there. And no, I again, I wanted to keep it intimate and personal for Stark, something that would cause him to make that decision. And um, the the more vocal of the faction was the 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 anti. Um, well, yeah. and my my yeah, the, the editor and, and publisher actually got into a, a shouting match uh, in the in the hallway. As I'm told, I wasn't there, but the next thing I knew, I was out the door. But oh well, you know, one of those things. It's the personal stories that people will remember more. Uh, you know, if you want a movie you're crashing to Earth, you put that in Thor. <laughs> Let Don Blake turn into Thor and save that because yeah, that's yeah, more his yeah. thing. So, so from, from, from Tony Stark to um, you know, Travis Morgan, uh, Oliver Queen, uh, Timberwolf in Legion of Superheroes, you're a very clean-shaven guy to be attracted to the, to the chin whisker man all the time, it seems like. Um, not for lack of trying. Uh, I, I, I grew a beard in the 70s thinking that, well, I'd look like Green Arrow, right? Um, <laughs> No, my beard comes in. I've got like four whiskers, and and, and that's it. Um, uh, I, I tried um, several years ago. I was uh, uh, wound up laid up for a few weeks, and I thought, you know, while I'm convalescing here, I'm going to grow a beard, and I'll come up looking like Ernest Hemingway. Well, at the end of six weeks. I looked like a homeless guy who hadn't shaved in about a week and a half. And, and that was it. That was it. There was no density to it. It just like scraggly stuff sticking out of my face. Like, yeah, I, I figured those guys have to go through some wax too. Cause I always had that look, nice looking curl that went out both ways at the tip of their beard. Uh, which was, uh, yeah, I, I, I tried, I tried curling my mustache when, when I had a mustache and, uh, one side would stay nice and curled. And the other side would always come down. So I'd be like, you know, yeah. one side sticking up like this, and the other side's just bleh, terrible. This is fairly new on me. My wife hates it, but uh, that's part of the reason why I grew it. <laughs> um, well, that, that says a little bit more about your relationship with your wife, don't you think? It's fun. Uh, <laughs> it, it's fun to annoy people sometimes on purpose. Uh, of course, the real reason we're here today is because you are um, – your your personally owned creation, creator owned creation, John Sable, uh, is being, and I, I, I guess I'm saying that correctly. You do own John Sable, right? Or oh yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but but we're getting that in an omnibus collection. Uh, the first of five issues. All how many issues is it total? Uh, I, I knew you were going to ask me that. Uh, Fifty. Six, I think. There, there's a lot of them. Yeah, a bunch, a bunch. Um, the uh, um, I, I was on the book as writer artist for the first 43, and then from there on for the next, I guess, a dozen books, um, I wrote it and did the covers, and uh, other artists uh, did the finishes on it, uh, completed the artwork on it. 
Uh, then I, I uh, over the years, I've done uh, two more series, uh, one called Blood Trail and another one called Ashes of Eden that were all collected eventually into, into uh, full volumes for the set. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be doing all of that stuff and more. Um, I've got a, another Sable story that we're going to throw in there at the end just to round things up and, and cap things off uh, nicely. Um, and there will be, uh, in addition, there will be uh, stuff printed in black and white. There will be um, uh, behind the scenes stuff, sort of step by step, um, so you can see how a, a story is developed from plot to script to uh, layouts to finished art. And um, um, a lot of unpub unpublished material that I've done over the years from um, uh, like sketchbook material and, um, and commissions. Uh, and uh, we're, we're just uh, in discussions now about uh, something else that if it if you pull this off it's going to be really cool but i'm not going to talk about it right now other than to say there will be more announcements as we go along here we have uh, 17 days left to run on a kickstarter and um we uh, came out of the gate gangbusters uh, everybody jumped in uh, and and supported this thing uh, right from the get-go um, um, it launched at uh, nine o'clock in the morning, and uh, that was because my editor and my cohort, Jeff Messer, is on the East Coast, and it was supposed to launch at um, at noon Pacific time, and uh, Jeff lost his mind and hadn't had enough coffee in the morning, and he thought. Wait a minute, the, the West Coast, uh, they're ahead of us, right? So he pushed the button, he pushed the button at nine o'clock in the morning and launched it. And by the time I woke up, we already had twenty-five thousand dollars. And it's it's been fantastic. We're sitting right now at thirty-eight thousand five hundred and ninety-six. Yes. And yes. Uh, uh, we're for, um yeah. no, no. You're sitting now at thirty-eight thousand oh. six hundred and ninety-one. Six ninety-one. There you it go. Held up on us here. Um, yeah, it did. So, so if that's somebody in our chat, thank you, thank you. I'm going oh, to thank it. you all. I'm going to claim it. This all. is our shake and this is what we call our shake and bake moment, Mike, uh, on our oh, show. Great. Somebody co uh, contributes to a campaign we're currently promoting. It's the uh, it's shake and bake. It's shake and bake. And I help. help. <laughs> what was that? That that that's my little video clip. Uh, anytime I anytime I feel like I help somebody. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, it's shaking back, and I'm help. I can see you, but I can't hear you. Uh-oh. That's not good. Hang on. I got nothing. How about now? No, I can't see you. Okay, you're coming back. Now? Yep, there you, there you are. Okay. That sometimes happens when people use their phone. I just got to bring them out, bring them back, and it all resets. Okay. But, but yeah, that's that's our um, – that, that's – Old commercial there, and I used to stick with me all my life. Anytime I help somebody, they're like, "Yeah, Howard helped out there." I'm like, "It's shake and bake, and I helped." Oh, okay, I got you. I got you. So, tell us a little bit about. Um, we we know who John Sable is, but I I do want to ask that uh, later on. A thing, but what was your uh, process for creating John Sable when, when you sat down? I mean, these, these characters, I know some, that, some of them arrive whole cloth and somebody's head and they're like, Oh, I just got to put him down. What, what were the building blocks to this character when you were making it? I, I was very fortunate uh, working with Mike Gold, who's uh, been a, a lifelong uh, cohort, um, a partner in crime on, on so many different projects over the years, but our, our first, Real collaboration was actually on Sable. Um, uh, he knew that I had broken away from DC to uh, concentrate on launching Star Slayer, which was one of the very first independent comics uh, to be published. Uh, create our own, yeah, create our own uh, independent publish uh, with a, a chance to actually earn some royalties on the thing. 
Uh, that didn't uh, exactly happen with Pacific Comics, uh, who had a very short lifespan. But um, as a result, um, it it demonstrated that the, the model was viable. So uh, when uh, Gold and his partners got together in Chicago and decided that they were going to uh, create this company called First Comics, as in first comics, then drugs, then the babysitter winds up in the freezer, right? Uh, or something like that. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, he called me up and basically offered me carte blanche to create anything I wanted to do. Um, any kind of a book, any kind of a story at all. And uh, I came up with Sable because um, at the moment I had been uh, doing the Tarzan comic strip in the Sunday papers and I was always a huge Africa buff. Um, I've, I've been on safari to Africa twice. And uh, um, from, from the time I was, I was a kid, I was just fascinated by the place. Uh, as a as a setting and a backdrop for the character, so uh, I wanted to do a, a book that would bring out the best in me, uh, make me uh, spend more time on my art, you know, become a better artist, a better storyteller, and um, be inspirational every time I sat down with a with a new story arc. And uh, that, that's what I did. I, I, I broke a bunch of the rules. It took me forever to learn how not to draw bulging muscles. You know, it, it, was, it was actually kind of a, a chore to, to sit down and go, okay, you have, you have to just drape the clothing on the guy. You know, you can't have it all skin tight all the time. Yeah. Um, and uh, that, that led me to something else too which was um, uh, an artistic epiphany. Um, between the time I drew the cover for issue number one and issue number two, it's a span of maybe six weeks or something like that, um, I bought two books. One was called The Magic Pen of Joseph Clement Call, uh, who's the, the turn of the century artist, illustrator of a uh, bunch of uh, Conan Doyle books and uh, uh, things like uh, The Lost World and uh, King of the Kyber Rifles, uh, King Solomon's Mines, uh, stuff like that. In a very linear uh, textured style, uh, but he could get a, a full range of tone uh, in a drawing that was essentially nothing but black and white. And uh, the second book was called The Pencil by Paul Kelly. And Callie does the same thing with a pencil that Cole did with a, with a pen. He's got that uh, amazing textured look. So that was, that was two things that changed. Um, my inspiration for the character in general was uh, I wanted to do something that was essentially the opposite of Batman, the reverse of Batman. Uh, no secret identity. Uh, none of this uh, wearing a disguise, none of the by day the mild mannered fill in the blank, and by night the dark avenger. Um, the only time Sable wears a uh, disguise of any kind is uh, when he has to do a personal appearance, which he does frequently because uh, he's also a closet nice guy. His his deep dark secret is that he writes children's books about a troop of leprechauns living in a fairy mound in Central Park, and uh, they're they're based on the the bedtime stories he told his children, um, and of course the the um, the tragedy in his life is that uh, his family is wiped out by poachers in a reprisal raid, and um, it it leads him to. Um, um, go off his nut, really. He tracks him down and, and takes his revenge in the most horrific way you could imagine. Uh, and then he winds up with nowhere to go, nothing to do. Uh, because if all you have left to live for is vengeance, what do you do when your vengeance is done? Now, in Sable's case, uh, he became a hopeless drunk 
I fell in with a group of mercenaries, came up on the wrong side of the law, and we wound up uh, being deported uh, from Africa back to his hometown of New York City. And uh, that's that's where uh, all of that uh, uh, sets him on his path where he becomes a, a freelance. Um, anything for a buck for hire. Adventurer, bounty hunter, bodyguard, excuse me, I'm just plugging in over here so I have some power on my phone. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Has this a tendency to kind of suck, suck things dry here pretty quick. Um, so he's 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 basically a drunk with a death wish. Uh, he's looking for someone to pull the trigger on him. Uh, he, he'll take any job as long as it's dangerous. Um, but still, you know, he's he's always packing a gun if he really wanted to kill himself. All he has to do is eat a bullet. But what he what he doesn't want to admit is that he's found something to live for. Uh, he carries this horrible guilt because he has moved on from the past, from the tragedy that was in his life in the past. And uh, so um, he's he's still doing the dangerous stuff, but uh, now he's got the love of a good woman to uh, give him something to uh, keep going for. And that, that always helps. Yes. Um Last Beat Industries in the chat here just says, uh, just just to let you know, I I once saw a guy who had the cover to Shaman's Tears number three tattooed on the side of his ribs. Um, that's that's taking your art to the grave with you. <laughs> you know, I've 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 seen stuff like that before. Um, a young lady uh, uh, came to me in uh, San Diego at Comic Con years ago. And uh, she said, I love your artwork. In fact, I carry it with me uh, wherever I go. Well, at, at a Comic-Con, that's not unusual, right? Right. And she says, no. And then she turned around, Dr. Halter top, and she had the cover for the Warlord issue number 50 tattooed on her back. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was a bit of a surprise. Um, Shaman's Tears, uh, I've, I've seen dozens and dozens of tattoos of the icon that I designed with the three red uh, tears coming down from the eye. Um, and uh, I've, I've seen it, I've seen it, um, you know, lots of military guys had it tattooed on their arm. Uh, one uh, uh, soccer player had it tattooed on the calf of his leg as a power symbol. And that was that was really kind of cool. Um, I don't have any tattoos myself except the the four that I have here, 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 and right there uh, from catching my pen as it was on the way to the floor. <clears throat> and it, it, every time it hurt like hell. Uh, oh. So yeah, so I had I had no no desire to get any more tattoos after that. Um, the oh, the other one that more code. Yeah, the other the other one that that uh, I saw was uh, I, I did a, a cover for Green Arrow, which was a, a painting of an old Indian wearing a headdress and a wolf skin on top, and the uh, the wolf's eyes are alive. And about six months later, that image showed up on the back cover of Skin Art magazine. Somebody had a tattoo. And it was a really good job. Uh, unlike most of the tattoos that I've designed for friends, I, I don't know who they're uh, getting to do their tattoo work, but in, in some cases, it's almost like it's Mel Lazarus. I don't know if you remember Miss Peach, the, the comic strip? Yes. Uh, yeah. It practically had both eyes on the same side of the nose. You know, I just go, okay, why did I even bother with this? But oh well. <laughs> Uh, di different tastes for different people, I guess. But uh, yeah, sure. I remember sure. Miss Peach. That was that was kind of weird. Uh, so the, the, uh, to to uh, loop back on on Sable here for just a little bit. Yeah. Um, the uh, the angle that I, I told you about of doing making him the reverse of Batman. Um, when ABC launched Sable as a 
blessedly short-lived TV series in 1987, they reversed my reverse and made it exactly like Sable, uh, like Batman. Um, by day, he's the mild-mannered children's author, and by night, he becomes the Dark Avenger. It's like, <laughs> you you guys missed the entire point. Missed the entire point. They fixed it, for you, Mike. They fixed it. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I I can't tell you how many times I've I've had that argument where um, somebody you know, who thinks they know what they're doing tells me that I don't know what I'm doing because they've got a better idea. And every now and then, they have to point out that I've been doing this for almost fifty years. I learned a thing or two along the line, and one of them is how to tell a story. <laughs> and create an interesting character. So, so if I'm digging through back issues, Mike, and I want to go back 50 years, where do I find your entry into the comics field? It would be uh, Adventure Comics number 435, I think. Uh, uh, an Aquaman story uh, called As the Undersea City Sleeps, written by Steve Skates, who is very much into the letter S. Um, he... Uh, yeah, I, I was uh, lucky enough to um, bump into Irv Novick at the New York Comic Con uh, in 1973. I was there basically trying to sell a comic strip called Savage Empire and getting nowhere with it. Uh, uh, newspaper editors would not even take my phone call. I mean, couldn't get an appointment to see anybody. Uh, worth a damn. Um, so I had six weeks of Sundays and two weeks of dailies and a full synopsis of the story um, in a portfolio and uh, uh, left it with Saul Harrison, who was a publisher then, pretty sure he was publisher at the time. Um, and uh, as I turned away from the table, uh, this older guy, and by older I mean, you know, or was probably 20 years younger than I am right now. So he's this creaky old, fit, you know, creaky 52 year old, 53 year old, old fart, as far as I was concerned. Yeah, he was, he was twice my age. Uh, and uh, uh, he took a look and, and uh, told me in no uncertain terms to get my carcass up to Julie Schwartz's office, which uh, when I did, I uh, walked in with that. You know, your standard encyclopedia salesman speech. You know, good afternoon, Mr. Schwartz. Can I interest you in this blah, 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 blah. And if you get interrupted anywhere along the line, you got to go all the way back to good afternoon, Mr. Schwartz. Right? <laughs> yes. And that's exactly how far I got. Good afternoon, Mr. Schwartz. And he looks up from his desk and he says, what the hell makes you think you can draw comics? And I unzip my portfolio and put it on his desk and said, take a look and you tell me. And uh, he uh, called Jill Orlando in from the office next door. They put their heads together and I wound up walking out 30 minutes later with a script in my hand. And when I when I delivered that first story, I got another one right away from Joe. And um, as I, I, I got back to my house, and I walked in the door and the phone was ringing. And it was, excuse me, it was Joe. He said, uh, Maury Boltonoff is on vacation. He doesn't know it yet, but Dave Cockrum just walked off the Legion of Superheroes. Would you mind if I recommend you for the job? Would I mind? I mean, it's <laughs> not. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, I guess, I know how that yeah yeah, I, I get a I, I get a um, short story um, that uh, David penciled. Uh, I got the the inking job on that as a as a tryout, and uh, when I turned it in, Murray goes down the hallway, talks to uh, Saul and Carmine, and comes back and says, well, "I got good news and bad news." I said, "Well, what's the good news?" He said, "You got the job." Great. What's the bad news? He says, "You can expect to get hate mail." I said, "I haven't even done anything yet." He said, "It it doesn't matter. For starters, 
you're replacing the most popular artist we ever had on the book. And to top things off, we're going to kill off one of the fans' favorite characters in your first issue. And he was right. You know, fan mail. We wouldn't exactly call it fan mail. Uh, unless fan mail always starts with, grill, you suck. <laughs> that was, yeah, it was, it was pretty harsh. Pretty harsh. But I, I, th I think I won him over eventually. Um, and and uh, I was on that book for, felt like 10,000 years. Um, and as glad as I was to get the assignment, I was equally glad when I was able to get off the book. Is it was a crusher. You know, every every page yeah, had to have like twenty characters. Oh yeah, so many of them. Um, the, the first legionnaire I can remember actually dying. Lightning Lad doesn't count because they all brought him back after a while. Uh, was Pharaoh Lad, uh, the um, the one who could turn himself into um, iron, flew it flew into the Sun Eater to kill him, and that was I think that was the first time I ever saw a superhero die. Period. Because uh, I was like in sixth grade then. I was like. Wait, they just killed somebody. Uh, I'm trying oh, to yeah. think. Was, was who, who was the one who died in your story? Invisible kid. Okay. Yeah, he was a popular one. So now I've got to make a list, Mike. You're going to send me to the flea markets, and I'm going to be digging stuff up here. <laughs> there you go. There so, you so go. while you're at DC, um, you did Warlord. Now, I'm that that was your creation. You created Warlord. Uh, yes, but you don't get to own it because, right? Uh, what how, how that how that came about was uh, uh, after I worked at DC for a while, I, you know, I had the, the assignments and everything else uh, going pretty good. Um, word circulated through the community that uh, Atlas Comics was firing up, and they were going to be offering creator ownership and a rate of a hundred dollars a page. Uh, and uh, went straight over there. We got an appointment to talk to Jeff Rovin, who was the editor, and uh, gave him my Savage Empire pitch. And I, he uh, got excited about it and said, Okay, we're going to do this. And I said, Just before you announce, let me get two issues in the can because I have assignments from DC and I want to demonstrate to them that this isn't going to affect my relationship with them at all. You will know, be able to, to do that, that additional work. They said, okay, fine. Uh, I walked 20 minutes across town to DC Comics and Carmine was waiting for me in the hallway because Jeff had picked up the phone as soon as I walked out the door. <laughs> and and called him to brag that he had, had me tied up. Yeah. And uh, Carmine said, why didn't you bring it to us? And I said, well, for starters, DC hasn't had a lot of luck with sword and sorcery type of stuff. Um, that was number one. I said, number two, they're offering $100 a page and creator ownership. And Carmine uh, thought for a second, he said, I can't give you $100 a page, but I can give you top rate. Well, my rate at the time was $42.50. And um, that was pencils and inks. And top rate was, uh, at DC, was, I think, sixty-seven fifty. Wow. And, yeah, yeah. And, and okay. So that was fine, uh, but uh, he said, and I can't give you creator ownership. We just don't do that here. Uh, but what I can give you is a guarantee of a one-year run. And he said, that's better than you're going to get with Atlas because the odds of them being around very long are pretty slim. And he was right. Writing on the wall with that one. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, and also... None of the artists, to my knowledge, none of the creators wound up owning their creations. Oh, the company one, the company wound up owning it all. And after the first couple of issues were uh, published, they fired all the artists and hired foreign artists who'd work for twenty-five bucks a page, pencils and inks, right? So um, 
it was it was a, a, a good choice. Uh, we launched with first issue, first issue special number eight, and then um, uh, Small Beat later uh, launched the regular series. Uh, and imagine my surprise when uh, I go into Joe's office to uh, read the lettered pages. I, I would always proof them before I took them home and ink in case there was any changes that had to be made. And I turn over the last page and I read the words at the end in the last panel. I said, that's, that's wrong. This is supposed to say next issue and then the title of the next story. And Joe says, uh, Carmine canceled the book. I said, he can't do that. He promised me a year's run. And Joe said, he lied. He does that. And so I was pretty much screwed there, except for the fact that about two weeks later, Jeanette Kahn walked in the door and canceled Carmine. Um, she uh, had studied all the stuff, uh, it, all the books. She knew the, the lineup, you know, like the back of her hand. And uh, she's looking at the publishing schedule and says, where's the one work? Turns out it was her favorite book. And they said, well, Carmine canceled it. She said, Carmine's not here anymore. Put it back. So that, that's how the, how the World War got, got uh, yep, uh, last minute reprieve. I and love course, Jeff for so many reasons, Mike. Uh, and, oh, yeah. and just gave me one more of them. I, I yeah. say all the time uh, when, when I get on here and I rant about today's comics, uh, is that I don't feel like there is a Jeanette Kahn or a Stan Lee or, or, a, or a Denny O'Neill or a Julie Schwartz. I don't think the comics industry today in the mainstream is run by people who love comics. Uh, uh, it's, it's not. It's not. Um, do you, do you, have, you have guys who have been in the comic industry in, in one aspect or another uh, long enough that... that uh, they they have a basic understanding of how the business runs and you have bean counters uh and traffickers um the editors no longer seem to have uh, a grasp of what makes a good story and I've, I've seen it time and time again um uh, incidents where um if i'm given a script to draw um, I find myself having to write back to the editor or send a message somehow uh, and, and say, look, this just doesn't work. Uh, one example was uh, uh, when I was doing the, the Arrow comic book um, that, that was basically written by the guys who were writing the, the TV show. And uh, I would do 10 pages a month. And they had a couple other artists doing the same thing. And then once a month, they would publish a book that uh, compiled of these stories. And I'd get one that features the Huntress. And on the first page, she's aiming her crossbow pistol um, down at something or somebody. And she's yelling and screaming, uh, but there's no explanation. Oh, oh, we lost Mike. Oh, dear. <laughs> All right. Well, I hope Mike uh, knows that he's uh, dropped um, and comes back in. Let me just quit, send him a quick message and let him know uh, you went black, Mike. All right, we'll just let him know there. All right, so while he's out, uh, there is a video on this page here, and I, I want to show the video for the Kickstarter because we always try to uh, play the videos for people.
Yes, you're right, Jeff. The comic book. As soon as we started talking about the state of modern comic books, uh, <laughs> they jumped in and kicked him off. He was on his phone, and uh, we we did have a couple of a uh, couple of freezes and a couple of glitches. Um, he plugged in the power. I hope that he was juicing up more than he was draining. If if you've ever used your phone to StreamYard before, uh, I have noticed that it does drain it like like nothing you've seen before. Uh, we have gotten this thing to uh, a good percent, 71% of its goal. We're at 38,976. Uh, one more backing at any level will bump this thing up over 39,000. Uh, we're trying to reach 55,000 before uh, December 22nd, I believe it is. Yes, there it is. Uh, December 22nd at 5 a.m. So it'll be an early morning uh, deadline. I think we're going to get it here. We'll take a look at some of the tiers, uh, hopefully while Mike is reconnecting. Uh, you can, of course, pledge without a reward, uh, $10. That, that, hey, that, there's an idea. Somebody pledged 24 bucks just to get that thing up and even. Uh, but, you know, 40, $45 will get you the digital version of the entire omnibus, uh, volume one. This is going to be five volumes. Pledge of $75 is the early bird special. This is only got 16 more, six, six more hours to go on the early bird special. If you're watching this live, uh, if you're watching it in replay, obviously it's going to have even fewer. Uh, so this is the deluxe oversized, uh, as he says here, think DC absolute editions. If you've seen those, those are huge. Uh, this is the definitive edition of Mike Grill's groundbreaking masterpiece. And if you pledge in the first 72 hours, which is where we are right now, You'll save $25 off the full price. Uh, there was a deal for the first 400 backers would all get a uh, trading card. Uh, that is, looks like it's still open here. There were 222 backers here, uh, four backers here. Yes, that's, that's still available. Uh, but there was also a print for the first 100 backers. That is gone. Uh, and this also is here, if you are a shop, uh, you can get two or three copies. If you want to buy multiples, get us, uh, get yourself a steep discount. Uh, you have to let them know uh, when you order it because this is at the normal price after six hours or up. So tick-tock, folks, tick-tock. Uh, <laughs> it, um, it is going to jump up to $100, and you will get the official book plate for the Kickstarter-only release uh, and this hardcover volume, which – is how many they, they've shed how many pages it is uh, it's going to be a lot it's going to be like here we go um this volume one covers issues one through 13 completing the major story arc of sable from his origins as an olympic athlete to his life and loss living with his family in africa to his personal death wish as a gun for hire upon his return to america uh, each volume will consist of approximately 400 pages of content. So that is going to be thick, thick stuff. It's more than just the uh, 13 issues going in here because that would obviously be just a, a, a pop-up. Uh, and there he is back. Mike, I, I just shilled and shilled and shilled. Um, I didn't know if you ran out of power or what happened there. but That's, that's exactly what happened. Uh, apparently my uh, power cord is bad. So I had to get a, a second power cord to get my phone plugged in so I can I used to have to run the show on mine and I know exactly what you're going through I had to get like Y adapters like so I could have headphones and power at the same time it was it was that, crazy yeah that that's exactly uh, what I've been doing but uh, that cord has uh, just bit the big one so this one seems to be working just fine Jeff Messer said it was the comic book mafia trying to silence your truth telling because we were talking about the state of <laughs> comics <laughs> <laughs> right. So, yeah, I was I was, uh, I was uh, telling the story about the the uh, Huntress story. Um, so uh, there was no indication of who she was talking to. You didn't even see the guy until like three pages in, and he's lying there on the ground. He's got a, a, a crossbow bolt in his leg, and. There's, there's no explanation of who the guy is or why she's angry with him or why she shot him. 
And so I, I wrote in gibberish dialogue, but I, I, I sent it back uh, with a suggestion uh, to the effect of uh, you bastard, um, you, you, uh, you raped my fiance, you ate the family dog, burned the Bible, all this other stuff, right? As, as some kind of an explanation. And I, I got a really nice note back from the guy who had written it. It was one of the producers of the show. And he said, oh, that's great. I, I, I never thought about that. Well, it turns out that what they were doing was they were using material that had been um, left out of the show. You know, your dialogue oh. scenes that had been cut out of the show. And um, the, what was wrong with that was that if you hadn't watched every single episode, if you hadn't seen last week's episode... You wouldn't understand what the story is about. Yeah, it, you, have to, you, you shouldn't have to be in on it. Right. Uh, not, not everybody uh, had that had that same problem. There was one writer in particular who uh, wrote a really cool story, and I'll end up writing to him a fan letter because to me it was like uh, watching uh, uh, an episode of Have Gun Will Travel where you get the introduction, you get the characterization, you have a plot, interesting setting, um, there, there's a deepening threat as it goes along, and it pays off with a twist and a little moral at the end. And uh, I thought that was fantastic. Um, unfortunately, guys like that who have that kind of storytelling ability these days seem to be few and far between. Um, if you take a look at Many of the comics that you see these days, um, they seem to wander around with no oh. no direction. You get a 100-issue commitment, and you're going to use all of them to tell one story. Uh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when when um, they, DC um, resurrected the, the Warlord at one point, and uh, I was not involved in it uh, in any way. Uh, and I read the first five issues of the book, and I couldn't figure out what the story was going to be yet. Um, you know, I'm I'm old school pulp kind of a, a guy. Um, my storytelling is uh, maybe not as not strictly Gonzo, but I believe in getting to the point as quickly as possible. Now, you can expand a story, but you have to introduce the characters. You have yeah. to let people know who these people, who these characters are, what their motivations are. Um, you have to have an inciting incident. Something has to happen, and it has to have something to do with the story, not just we're going to do a new story every month based on a group of characters and and there's no cohesiveness to it um my run on on uh, green arrow for instance uh i had a new uh, adventure every two to six issues uh six issues was the longest i i, I think i carried uh, a story arc through but central to all of that was the love story between ollie and dinah that's that's the the whole crux of, of the the of the series, is is that it's an ongoing love story. It's a romance uh, with folks coming coming back in the door here, and uh, um, your alarm system went off. Yeah, yeah, the yeah the the, the little dog barks every time anybody walks in. Um, and uh, there's not much I can do about it <laughs> except strangle him. Um, sometimes I'd like to. Anyway, um, the uh, the other the other storyline that I uh, was going to mention is uh, in the Warlord. In the very first issue, uh, first issue special, there's a panel where Morgan gives Tara his wristwatch, and she puts it on her arm, wears it on her, on her bicep like a bangle. And as I was drawing that panel, I figured out how I was going to end the story 
who was going to kill Morgan, how and why, and what part that wristwatch played in it. And 35 years later, I actually got to do that story. But I was always aiming for it, um, you know, sort of Michael Corleone kind of thing, right? Um, and, and in Sable, uh, I took time to build up the relationships. Um, the, the standard uh, comic book relationship usually went something like um, you introduce the hero and his family on page one by page three the family is all dead yep. uh, and yeah and and you don't give a crap uh, because the writer doesn't give a crap about them he's just uh, using them as an excuse for the hero to run a buck and kill a bunch of bad guys um, in in my case um, I I took a long time to build up Sable's family uh, made made people understand what his family life was so they would understand the effect that their death had on him and how he could turn from just a basically a regular guy um, to a, a bloody killer uh, you know what, what made it happen and then um, when I, I brought him back to New York to launch his career as a, as a gun for hire. Um, he falls for the girl who illustrates his children's books. And I took another two years to get them into bed together because I wanted it to mean something. Uh, you don't just just jump from, oh, my family's dead, let's get laid, right? Yeah, um, yeah. so I, I, I took that amount of time to build that up and and uh, uh, it, it's ongoing uh, kind of thing along the way um, I actually discovered that uh, along with um, revealing Iron Man's secret identity apparently I created the first gay character in comics thank you uh, I, had, I had no idea yeah I had uh, uh, Gray Adler in in, uh, uh, in Sable uh, he's uh, Mike M Y K E, Mike Blackman's uh, roommate, and I, I had no idea that there had never been a gay character uh, in comics before. Um, it certainly wasn't a, uh, an agenda of any kind that I was uh, trying to promote. Although if someone had told me you absolutely can't do that, I would have said, "Oh, just watch me," because <laughs> I'm that kind of obnoxious little brother kind of attitude, you know? Um, uh, and I've, I've always been uh, that sort of defiant nature. Um, but, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I got a, I got a phone call. I got a phone call from uh, a, a pal um, who wanted to know if I'd be interested in taking part in a panel at San Diego Comic-Con one year. Uh, to discuss the role of gay characters in comics. He said, because you created the first gay character. I, I had no idea. Um, the, 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 the real reason he was, he was there was uh, because he's uh, Mike's roommate, Sable, thinks they're their boyfriend-girlfriend, uh, and, and he's embarrassed by it. So to uh, cover his faux pas, uh, he... Um, invites Gray to go to a sporting event with him, and uh, oh no, he takes him up. Oh yeah, Gray takes You're him up. Your own story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he and, invites Mike to the sporting event, and she pushes Gray off on him. Uh, he's going to give uh, them the tickets, and yeah. then she he says uh, she's not. He's not my. I'm not his type. And uh, he says, "Oh, yeah. what's his type? Short, fat, and dumpy." And she says, "No, tall, dark, and handsome." Exactly. Exactly. And and, and it was. For the joke, I was going for the joke, right? Yes. And then, and then the, the character became interesting enough to uh, keep the keep the uh, story going with him, keep him involved in, in the in the various arcs from time to time. Uh, but but that was the the whole purpose. So uh, I I tell the guy, sure, I'll be on your panel. So I get to San Diego and I open the convention booklet uh, to look at the 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 uh, panel schedules, and uh, I read uh, Gays in Comics featuring Mike Grell. 
<laughs> thereby ensuring that if I wanted another date in San Diego, I'd have to brown bag it, right? Bring one from home. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> there, there, there was me and uh, Max Allen Collins as the two heterosexual bookends. And in between us on this long dais is every combination of boy, boy, girl, girl, boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, girl. Not sure what you are, not sure who you are or anything like that, that you could possibly imagine. And I, I found out that apparently um, it, just what, what sort of young man uh, finds me attractive. That was, <laughs> it, was, it was so weird because uh, I was invited to party with everybody. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. No, no. It's, you met my girlfriend? <laughs> you know, so I'm, I'm good, honest. Um, Clem in the chat here says he, he loved the look on John's face when uh, when she said tall, dark, and handsome. Yeah. And I'll take that even further because I, I, I told you this uh, a couple of years ago when we got to talk when you were being inducted into the Hall of Fame, um, that that scene had an impact on me uh, growing up. My, I, I grew up in a Midwestern town of 900 people. So, you know, homophobia was rampant among young teenagers and such. Yeah. Uh, and I, when I read that scene in there and I got all the way to the whole, uh, you know, John's discomfort the entire time uh, sitting next to him. And, and, and Gray turns out and says, you know, just because you're straight doesn't mean you hit on every woman you see. I, anyway, I had a great time. And the way that Mike just, uh, that, that John just processes that, you can see it in his facial expressions. He just kind of stops and says, you know what? I did too. And they shake hands and they're they're off company. Yeah. And I was yeah, like, yeah. oh, I get it. <laughs> right. Right. I, I, like you, I grew up in, in a very tiny town. Uh, uh, I don't know if my town had more people in it than you, but certainly more cows. A uh, hundred miles north of Green Bay. And it was the, it was the same thing, um, uh, except for a, a couple of cousins uh, who were gay. And uh, one or two other people in, that I knew of in the county, they almost never encountered uh, uh, anyone who, who was gay. Um, and there was a lot of homophobia uh, back then. And, and it, so it wasn't until I get out in the world to go to art school, um, I you know, uh, out in the in the working world, working at a um, at an ad agency. Um, I was kind of flabbergasted to discover that it, it, it's not a rare thing at all. You know, it's, yeah. it's like, no, and, and, and for the most part, you'd never know uh, because they, 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 nobody's pestering me. I, I can't remember the last time I got my fanny pinched, you know, um, <laughs> it, it just, just yeah, doesn't it's happen. Like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but but it was it was fun. It was it was fun to do, and um, if I, I guess if if I had been uh, more aware of the lack of a gay character, um, I would have been more inclined. But I, in general, I don't do something just for the sake of uh, public relations or you know, uh, uh, getting some kind of a, a big bang for the buck. Uh, I didn't reveal. Tony Stark's secret identity for any other reason than that I felt it was a bit on the silly side that nobody had figured it out yet, right? Um, yeah. And the same thing with uh, um, Green Arrow books. Um, number one, I, I never called him Green Arrow except once. Um, and as soon as I was able to, I got rid of the little domino mask because basically if you're not not fooling anybody with one of those, and it's the same thing. Same thing goes for the the face paint that Sable wears, and um, I in uh, Green Arrow. I even made it a point to when when he takes the mask off um, and you know it admits who and what he is. Um, if people around him are going. But wait, that was that was supposed to be a secret? Like, yeah, <laughs> no one will ever recognize you. Yeah, I got a blonde mustache and a goatee. 
and and a domino mask. You'll never know who I am. Never know who, if COVID has taught us anything. It's that these little masks, even over our mouth and nose, you know who everybody is. <laughs> it's, it's not, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. But if you're not if you're not going full face mask, <laughs> there's no point in it. Um, I was gonna say earlier you were talking about Warlord. I'm guessing that you don't even get a, a royalty check when he appears in anything um, like. I I don't get a royalty check if he appears in somebody else's book, uh, but I do get a royalty check for stuff that goes back so far you wouldn't believe it. I always said one of the great things about DC is that if they owe you twenty five cents, they'll spend forty nine cents on a stamp to mail you a check for twenty five cents. Yep, and it. Uh, I, I get a, a, a royalty check every quarter, and it's for stuff that I don't even remember doing in, in many cases. Um, and it, it's like um, uh, 18 cents for this and 35 cents for that and a buck oh two, you know. Uh, and it, it, it's a full accounting of everything that sold, how many copies and where, and... It just comes through the mail slot, and I cash the check every single time. Uh, I don't have to fight for it, um, the, and uh, it it's better than um, a lot of situations that I've been in where even though it's it's been written down that you're owed a royalty, if you don't track them down and ask for it or demand it, you're not going to get it. Mike, we just passed 39,000. All right. 39,071. Thanks for alerting me, Jeff Messer. Appreciate you on that. Um, Outstanding. So so Ethan Van Skyver has talked about uh, how he gets a royalty check from uh, the Justice League movie uh, because they mentioned Iron Heights Prison, uh, which which he had created. Uh, I'm just wondering if, if Travis Morgan were to show up on, uh, say, Legends of Tomorrow, the television series that goes all over the place in D.C., and they haven't gone there yet. Would would that be something that you would get some some sort of uh, yeah yeah I'd, yeah I'd, I'd get something. Uh, but you also have to remember that um, this is Warner dealing with Warner. Okay, um, they've they've got a, a, a handshake deal, a sweetheart deal um, going there. When they did the the Arrow TV series. Um, they used two of my characters uh, throughout the first season, um, Shadow and Eddie Fires. That's right. They're both 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 my characters, but um, DC basically licensed those characters to uh, Warner for a nickel. I mean, what what, what would amount to, relatively speaking, a nickel? And so uh, if I'm getting 5% of a nickel, uh, you can imagine how much that is, right? Um, the, between, the, between the two characters um, for that one year that they were on TV, uh, I made 500 bucks each. And that was it. You need to get them into a movie where there's like an $89 million gross, and then you can get, get a nice... Five percent of a nickel off of that. Each one of those. Yeah, yeah. You know they 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 were um, they were uh, okay. Lots of lots of people. The famous lots of people. Yes. Uh, I've I've heard from a lot of people who watched the Aquaman movie, and they thought that there was a scene in there that harkened back to Scar Tars. and in a lot of ways there there were, and. Um, um, they seem to think that that was a harbinger of something to come. I'd love to see it. I would love to see it. I would too. It, 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 it's a it's a unique concept of you know the whole hollow Earth and there's a world inside the world with a sun in the center of everything. Uh, right. I was I was always enamored of it as a, as a kid reading this thing. In fact, I was like that, that was my soap opera of all the comic books out there. Warlord was my soap opera because I'm like Tinder's right there. That's your son. Oh, you passed him again. You didn't see him. <laughs> so. Yeah, 
Yep, that that was intentional. That was intentional. Oh, you you you! It was like Gilligan's Island for me. It's like he's never gonna get his kid back. They're never gonna get off that island. Uh, but but yeah, the last time I saw Warlord uh, was just actually a couple of months ago. DC put him in Young Justice of all things. Um, Superboy's been palling around with him in Scartaris, and the Teen Titans come rescue him. I'm like, what? But that's uh, just- yeah. Yeah, I, I do uh, one page uh, in that book. Um, and, uh, no, wait a minute, I think I do more than that. Yeah, I actually do, I actually do uh, several pages. Uh, but, um, yeah, for the most part, uh, I'm out of the loop. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't really a fit. And it, 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 it smacked of, you know, trademarks expiring, let's show use uh, <laughs> kind of thing. Well, yeah, there there is that. Um, in in the, a lot of cases, uh, you know, I've been asked over, over the years how I feel about someone else taking over something that I either I created or had a serious hand in, and um, I I always remind people about what I faced when I took over Legion of Superheroes, which is that um, uh, different doesn't mean it's bad. It's just different, and uh, everybody's got their own individual tastes. And the odds are that um, if you give the new guy a chance, he's going to show you what he can really do. Uh, it, it's hard right at the beginning when you take over a project uh, because you don't know, you know what what your range of freedom is creatively. Um, you know, you, you try to try to do something that's not going to offend too many people, um, and uh, uh, give yourself a chance to reach out and, and connect with readers better. So, you know, uh, different isn't bad; it's just different. Speaking Although of sometimes it is bad. <laughs> oh yeah, sometimes it's bad. You know, if at first you don't succeed, you know, skydiving probably isn't for you. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, Thirty-nine one sixty-six, by the way. Uh, so this, the, 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 I, I love watching that just flicker and scroll. Um, Thank you, but, guys. But that, talking that's about, amazing. It, it is. It, it, we're going to read. I, I, go on fifty-five right now. Just, just, just go there. Just, just why waste time? <laughs> there you go. Uh, this is a you know your your first Kickstarter. Is this? No, this is actually the. The third one that I've been involved in, the first one was Maggie the Cat. Um, and we are going to be uh, doing a, another Maggie the Cat Kickstarter here very shortly. Um, the second one was uh, Mark Ryan's The Pilgrim, um, which uh, we had done uh, a couple of issues about 10 years ago. And um, the company that was publishing was Comic Mix. And they they fell on hard times and and just couldn't manage to uh, keep it all together. So uh, Mark Ryan is the uh, the the actor who uh, plays Nazir on Robin Sherwood. He uh, does the voices for Bumblebee and Jetfire in the Transformer movies and uh, other things. Uh, Black Sails. Uh, he's a he's an all around Renaissance kind of guy. Um, and he, he uh, created the story of the pilgrim, and it was it was really really intense. So um, uh, we got together and uh, uh, raised enough money to uh, republish those books, and also to get a launch on the the next books in the series, so he can continue it. Uh, he's already got um, um, a TV series in development on that. So uh, it, it's it's going to be gangbusters, um, and then uh, of course John Sable freelance. Uh, now the Maggie the Cat uh, I mentioned earlier we're going to be uh, doing another uh, Kickstarter for Maggie. Um, the advantage that we have here with Sable is that that material is already completely finished. Um, we will be going back in and remastering. Um, most of the artwork uh, as time goes by um, to get 
cleaner, crisper blacks and better coloring, better better resolution on the page because uh, we'll be doing um, the, the volumes uh, for the omnibus edition will all be on, on slick paper, uh, glossy paper, um, new wraparound painted covers, uh, dust jacket, and uh, all kinds of cool stuff like that. Your, your wide shots were always my favorite. I mean, that that was that was a staple of Warlord. Was you know you turn you turn the page and and you see you know under the single unblinking sun of Scartaris, there's one rule, and it's this huge double page shot of of a of a fight scene in action. You just jumped right in. Uh, so I can't wait to see what you do for a double page uh, a, a wraparound cover uh, with John Sable in action. Yeah, it's it's going to be a dandy. It's going to be a dandy. Um, I'm going to design it so that. Uh, there'll be uh, a design element on the spine of the book that when everything is put together, you'll have uh, a complete image uh, on your bookshelf. Uh, we're going to do a slipcase for that fifth volume as well. Each one's going to have about 400 pages. And our plan right now is to do um, issues 1 through 13 uh, in volume one, and then uh, more supplemental material in, in the back end. The the reason for that that thirteen is because that will wrap up the arc with the uh, Vietnam story that I did. Yeah, this uh, it talked down here earlier about the page count, and I was trying to do the math in my head. Um, okay, so. That's Couple of thousand pages, yeah. Yeah, so oh, overall, yeah. Uh, looking at the volume one is issues one through thirteen. Um, you figure those were twenty-two page floppies, give or take, back in the day. Uh, and we lost him again. Oh, <laughs> all right. Well, then this would be a perfect time to say that we saw the one hundred dollar uh, tier, uh, but there is also a one hundred and ten dollar tier which is John Sable Freelance Volume 1 and a Sable novel. Uh, yes, there was a Sable novel. So you would get the Omnibus Volume 1, uh, the digital copy of the novel, revised edition, and a official book play. So you'll get a digital digital copy of the John Sable novel. Uh, pledge $120 or more. Uh, this is for the comic shops. Uh, get two copies of the Omnibus at this discounted rate. So $120 or anything above that, uh, you're going to, you know, you'll get two books. Uh, so you're getting you're getting a discount off of the seventy five dollar discount. Uh, that would be great. Comic shop guys out there, you want this in your store because you know that people are going to come get it. Uh, one hundred and twenty five dollars. You're getting volume one signed and numbered. So there's going to be a limited number of uh, of these. There's only only one hundred of them. There's eighty one of them left. Nineteen people have already jumped on this with one hundred and twenty five bucks uh, signed by Mr. Grell and numbered, uh, you'll, you'll know if you got number one of a hundred, number a hundred of a hundred. Um, I just, if it was me, I'd just go one of a hundred on all of them. Let everybody think they had the first one. Uh, Cause what are you gonna do? Talk to each other? There's only a hundred people out there. It's never gonna happen, right? Uh, <laughs> no, I would not do that. Cause somebody will put it on eBay someday. Uh, and then everybody's eyes would be opened. Uh, $150. Uh, ooh, first edition of the Sable novel. You know, I would love to see Mike put uh, John Sable and Remo Williams uh, together in a story, uh, only because I write the Remo Williams books, so I've got a vested interest in that. Uh, maybe someday. That would be fun to see. $150 is the Masterstroke Grell Collection. So this is the John Sable Freelance Omnibus Volume 1, uh, Maggie the Cat Book 1, which he was just talking about having uh, kickstarted before, uh, The Pilgrim, which you also heard about, the Mike Grell sketchbook, John Sable Rules of the Hunt bonus comic, a digital copy of the Sable novel, and the official book plate for the Kickstarter only release. Uh, wow, 150 bucks. That's for $50. It's 100 bucks to get the book if you've already missed the uh, the early bird. $50 more to get three more, four more hard copy books uh, plus a digital of the novel. That. That's a, that's a no-brainer. What were you saying here, Jeff? Uh, first comics did 20, oh, 28 page issues. So thank you, thank you. Uh, I was, um, I did not know they were 28 pages. They were thinking thick, 
long before um, long before we were. Let me see if Mike has messaged me here. Uh, not yet. That's his, that's his old email. He said he, his phone died. Um, assuming that his phone has died again and he's just still not getting power to it, uh, we might have to just assume that he's not going to come back. Uh, we'll hang around long enough to see if he does. And if he does, we'll let him, you know, stick around as long as he wants to have time. Or we might just try to wrap things up so that, you know, we don't have it happen again. Uh, thank you, everybody who has been participating in the chat today. Uh, and who has been helping to, oh, there are more tiers. I should, I should scroll. Uh, $160, comic shops only, three copies of the Omnibus. Uh, so, wow. So it was 125 before. Now it's, that is a super steep discount. Uh, I need to get my comic shop guy to look at this because to get three copies of the Omnibus for 160 bucks, that's a, that's a hell of a deal. Uh, $200, these, they keep going is the John Sable Freelance Omnibus plus a Grell Quick Sketch. Uh, so you got, you got Omnibus 1, you got a Quick Sketch of Sable, you get a digital copy of the novel and the official book plate. There's only going to be 20 of those. Seven have taken them. So, and then is this the, it, no, it's not the ultimate last one. Uh, $225, the ultimate Masterstroke Grell Mystery Box. Ooh. Uh, let's see what's in the mystery box here. So get the omnibus as well as copies of the recent Masterstroke Studios releases for Maggie the Cat, the Pilgrim Book One, the Mike Grell Sketchbook, plus items from previous Kickstarters. And these items may include the super popular Legion of Superheroes Sketchbook and Sketch Cards. Uh, when you pledge, just let us know you are a Legion fan and we'll make sure you get those items as part of your mystery pack. Uh, the John Sable bonus black and white comic Rules of the Hunt could be a John Sable t-shirt, art prints from Maggie and the Pilgrim Kickstarters. Uh, one out of every 20 pledges for the mystery box will also get a Sable quick sketch. So it's kind of a lottery going on there. Uh, inside of the front of your copy of the Omnibus, along, oh, in, in the book, it will be sketched in the book, along with a personalized thank you from Mike. The mystery box will be easily valued at 250 or more. Uh, this is the sweetest deal of the bunch with the most perks, but we're only making a hundred of them. So don't dawdle on this one. Uh, six people have taken that one. Uh, gosh, they keep going. A lot of tears on here. $250. Uh, the, this one will get you only 20 of these available. Uh, the omnibus, the digital copy, uh, the head sketch, and the official book plate. So you get that nice head sketch going on in there. Mike, you're back. Did you run out of power again? Uh, yep. And this is probably going to happen again before too long. So, do you want to wrap it up? Uh, I, I think I think we probably but should. But I want to leave this on a uh, a positive note uh, and thank everyone who's been so kind and generous. Uh, the the outpouring has been just fantastic. Uh, guys like you uh, who give me the opportunity to come on and talk to the fans for as, as long as my battery will last. Um, uh, sometimes I uh, wonder how long it takes for my own battery to run down. Uh, I have a, um, an old saying, I just keep talking until I think of something to say. Uh, <laughs> but but that's something to, to say is, thank you all very much for your support uh, and generosity. Um, and thanks for buying me all that food, man. I've, putting it to good use as you can tell everybody in the chat uh just just loving you mike uh, you're the absolute best uh it'll be awesome to see this in oversized volume uh, so yeah it, we're, we're glad to have you on i was going to ask if you've ever considered everybody's crowdfunding comics these days original comics uh we didn't know if you were going to have some something in the hopper where you were going to do uh, an original graphic novel of some kind at some point uh with with a new character I actually have uh, several uh, that uh, are in in my list of, of things to do uh, before I uh, shuffle off this mortal coil, which is going to be uh, long time. Be the, the, yeah, well, it may not be the, the best artist in comics, but I want to be the oldest. Um, so, uh, yeah, I've, I do have a, an all original story that uh, I definitely want to want to do. Um, I have a, a couple of novels in, in the works. 
uh, I'm doing a novelization of Savage Empire, uh, which uh, you guys will hopefully get a, a peek at here in the coming year. Um, and I have a, another one that's a, a fantasy uh, romance called Earthbound, and you can probably figure out what that one's about. Um, and uh, yes, I just, there, there's more. I, there, you never run out of material, you know. Uh, in most cases, I feel like it's uh, more a case of um, getting the time to work on all of it. Uh, so w with that in mind, um, some of the, the new stuff I'll be doing, uh, I've been lucky enough to uh, work with uh, Stephen B. Scott uh, on The Pilgrim. Uh, Steve jumped in and finished off the inks over my layouts on, on the, the remaining pages on, on the, the one story. And so um, I, I think that's a, a really good working combination. Uh, the, the guy is just an amazing storyteller, uh, great graphics, um, elegant artist. Uh, if you get a chance to check out his Normandy Gold comic book, you'll see what I'm talking about. Of course, he's done Batman and Wolverine and tons of other things. And I'd love to do a project with Steve where I'd write it and turn him loose to draw. Absolutely. Sounds like a plan to me. Uh, Mike, thank you for coming on the show. Hang on just a second while I end the stream. I want to ask you something offline here. Okay. Uh, All right. Lose power. Uh, to everybody in the chat, thank you so much for, uh, for making me look good uh, to, you know, getting these backers while Mike's on the show. Uh, we appreciate you guys coming in. Be sure to subscribe and uh, hit that like button. It, it will help us out. You can you can see we're still growing our viewing hours over here. We got to reach that four thousand hours mark uh, at some point, or we're just you know a voice in the wilderness and we're not making money, <laughs> which is the goal. Yeah, there you, there you go. Right? Yeah. All right. So we're well, making money for me today. Uh, well, you know, we had, we added a, a few hundred dollars while we we're just talking here. I, I think it bad. went four hundred uh, is what. Um, yeah. They said in the chat there, up 400 plus. So good job. Good job to the chat. Thank you all for doing that. And we'll end it with that.